everyone, please get seated, or we may start our celebration. Okay. Good morning, church. A, well, a warm welcome to all of us here from the Light Group. Thank you for all of you here gathered physically to worship our God together. And a warm welcome to all of you tuning from YouTube Live, the Salt Group, and those that are beyond. Thank you for all joining us here virtually um, to worship our God together. My name is Jeff, and I'm a partner at Southside Bible Church. If you are new or joining us for the first time, it is our blessing to welcome you to SBC. And really glad that you can join us on this very special day to worship our God together. Now, before we begin, let us quieten our hearts and let us start with our prayer to our God. Lord Jesus, our great high priest, you have opened a new and living way by which we, your fallen sinful people, can approach you with acceptance. May we be justified by your blood, saved by your life, joined to the Holy Spirit, and take up our cross to follow you. Please help us to contemplate who you are, the perfection of your sacrifice, the effectiveness of your intercessions. Guide our worship this hour, and may the words of our lips and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, what a great privilege it is to be gathered here today to worship our God as one family in Christ. Now here is what's in store for today. I'll just give you a quick few seconds to have a read. Now at SBC, we're reminded to sing to our God, to remember His Word, to respond to His grace, and to reflect on His awesome glory. Now I'm going to invite Daniela and Wei Shen to lead us in worship. Thanks, Jeff. It is good to be here this morning, and it's a great privilege to be able to um, still sing as a congregation. So will you stand and join us? We're going to sing Amazing Grace, and then we'll sing Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me, a great reminder of God's grace to us this morning. Let's sing together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now. is 
fate I dread I know I am forgiven The future sure The price it has been paid For Jesus bled And suffered for my pardon And he was raised To overthrow the grave To this I hold My sin has been defeated Jesus now and ever is my plea All the chains are released I can sing, I am free Yet not I, but through Christ With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the Please take a seat. Well, thank you, music team. Once again, if you join us late, welcome to you all. We're currently going through the book of First Timothy. Now, Dom from last week's sermon reminded us to guard our faith against all the false teachings that's looming around in our lives. Now, speaking of this, um, this is the book that I've been reading recently. It's called Everyday Theology, How to Read Cultural Text and Interpret Trends by Kevin Van Hooser. Now, in this book, it actually talked about very similar messages. It talks about the fact that this culture around us and we cannot avoid it. You know, through all the activities that we're indulging every day, for example, going to work, listening to, you know, colleagues talking about things, the news, movies, TVs, dramas, uh, games, anything we surf on the net. So all these are cultural things that will influence us. So we must be really careful to guard our hearts against what actually goes in. And we really need to dwell in the reality, the real world that is presented to us in the scriptures, rather than all these counterfeit worlds that are projected by all these media, all these information every day. So I'm really looking forward to what Dom will talk to us today about from First Timothy. Now, just some housekeeping things. If you look at the... Uh, yep, just have a look at the slides here. 
Uh, first, I really want to thank God that um, COVID-19 has been free in ACT, but we church here uh, still need to follow um, the COVID-19 regulations uh, imposed by the government. So let's uh, remind each other again that we must keep a social distance of 1.5 meters apart and make sure that you keep your hands and everything hygiene cleaned according to the COVID safety regulations at the back of our church. Now the leaders will be meeting uh, this afternoon. Please keep them in your prayers for God to guide them um, to make wise decisions for the future of our church. Now as seen from the photo on the right, Yesterday morning, it looks like the sisters at SBC had a wonderful, blessed time gathering together for fellowship and prayer. Uh, for those of you that are at the north side and you think, oh, no, I've missed out on this. Don't worry. There will be another one called the Gungalan Bible Church Prayer at Joseph's Place next Saturday at 8 a.m. So be sure to key into your calendars. Joseph also mentioned that you're all welcome to join them for breakfast and fellowship afterwards. So make sure that you attend. Now at SBC, we encourage everyone to stay on mission for Christ during this COVID period as the light shining in darkness to give people the hope and bring them to Christ. So please use all the free materials uh, that we have given to you from SBC, for example, the word one-to-one, -one, or pursue opportunities to share the gospel wherever possible. For example, my wife and I have been started word one-to-one -one with a couple of families, and we really had a blessed time to really talk to people, talk to them, sharing our life, our struggles, and also our faith. It has been a really blessed time just uh, when everyone's involved in this whole process. Now also a reminder that Solid Rock and BKs are definitely running today during Dom's sermon. So for Solid Rock, please see Rachel and Narada during uh, Dom's sermon. And for BKs, please see Shane Weston. Yeah, just checking if you're awake or not. <laughs> Shane Weston's wife, Sarah Weston. <laughs> And for the parents that are watching from home, there's also a BK's activity sheet uh, available at our church website, as usual. All right, next. Um, at SBC, we're really passionate and committed to global mission because we want to see the gospel to go out all across the globe to bring people to the knowledge of the truth and to save them from their souls. So Howard and Michelle is one of the family that is uh, one of our many uh, global mission partners. Here are some highlights from them at the moment. Unfortunately, during, uh, due to COVID-19, they're not able to return physically to Philippines to do God's work there. But they had the opportunity to use a lot of online tools to continue minister to the people in Philippines. And also, they had the opportunity to uh, do a lot of different talks um, around various places in Sydney and really thank God that the kids are adjusting very well in Australia at the moment. Uh, please uh, continue to keep them in your prayers and we will also pray with them, uh, pray for them together shortly in our corporate prayer time. Now, at SBC, we have a habit of reading parts of the Bible each week. Now, this week, I've tried very hard to find someone very special to read the Bible for us. Please let us welcome my mom, Linda, who will read to us Psalm 119, verse 33 to 48. Verse 33 to verse 48. 
Psalm 190 from verse 33 to 48. Teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees, that I may follow it to the end. Give me understanding so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your command, for there I find delight. Turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Fulfill your promise to your servant so that you may be feared. Take away the disgrace I dread, for your law are good. How I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, preserve my life. May your unfailing love come to me, Lord, your salvation according to your promise. Then I can answer anyone who, who taught me, for I trust in your word. Never take your word of truth from my mouth, for I have put my hope in your laws. I will always obey your law forever and ever. I will walk about in freedom, for I have sought out your precepts. I will speak of your statutes before kings and will not be put to shame. For I delight in your commands because I love them. I reach out for your commands which I love that I may meditate on your decrees. Oh, thank you, Linda. <laughs> yes, thank you, Mom. Now, please join me in corporate prayer. Let us bow our heads. Dear Sovereign Lord, you who formed the land and sea and everything that is within by the power of your word. Thank you for revealing yourself through your word in the Bible. We thank you for your sovereign grace that you have given us the privilege to gather physically here today to worship you. We pray for all the churches around the world that are struggling through the COVID, that you extend your grace upon them and guide them to keep the faith and become beacons of lights during this dark period so that everyone will see their good deeds and praise your name in heaven. We pray for the sick and vulnerable here at SBC. We pray that during their pain and suffering, you will be their comforter and healer as they trust in your power and unfailing love. We pray that our hearts will be filled with your love and continue to express our love to care for the sick and vulnerable during this pandemic period. We pray for the Australian government that they will make wise decisions to govern and protect the people in Australia during the COVID pandemic. We pray for Christian education in schools at Namaji and Waniasa Hills. We pray that you will empower the teachers at SBC with your love and wisdom to share your words with the children, to bring them to an understanding of your gospel truth. We pray for the leadership meeting this afternoon, that you will unite the leaders at SBC in one spirit and empower them with your wisdom to make decisions for SBC's future according to your will and purpose. We pray for all the brothers and sisters at SBC that you will empower us with your Holy Spirit and live out your gospel truth during the pandemic, to love others in action and to share your gospel for those living in darkness. We pray for Michelle's Bible study 
online that the Filipino ladies will be better equipped to apply the knowledge of the Bible in their lives and in their small groups. We pray for Howard's Tagalog sermons online that those who watch them will be encouraged in their faith. We pray for Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Church, the Seed Community Church at Swan Hills. We give thanks that although they may not have the privilege to gather in person, but they're still able to gather online via Zoom meetings. We pray for John Lawrence and his team that you would guide them during this pandemic, that they keep in touch with their flocks and continue to guide and strengthen them in their faith. And finally, we pray that you will use Pastor Dom as your vessel to proclaim your word to us this morning. May our ears and hearts be in tune to your word as you speak to us and lead us to come to a knowledge and understanding of who you are and the truth of your gospel. We pray all of this in the holy and precious name of Jesus. Amen. That's it. I'm dismissing the kids. Yes, I will do that. I'm just testing. We're doing a bit of a test of microphones and stuff, but the buzz is gone, which is nice. Uh, Bible kids, exciting times. Uh, you get to meet with Shane. No, Sarah. Shane had a heart attack there before. Uh, and also Jack and Sarah. So Bible kids. Uh, now's the time. So BK's up and follow your leaders out there. I'm nice and loud and booming. Uh, and for solid rockers, we have Nerida and... Rachel, thank you. So, Solid Rock Teens, you get to go through 1 Timothy, the same passage that we're doing today. Uh, I'm booming away here. Is it just up here or is it there too? You guys will work it out. Thank you. The Sound and Tech team today, if you're watching online in the dispersion, nice to see you. Uh, we have um, uh, Mark and Craig uh, um, booming the images. They're the, they're the stream team this morning. I've decided that uh, I'm declaring that spring is here, so I've got a short T-shirt on and shorts, and it's nice to be here. Uh, if I haven't met you before, my name is Dom, and I look forward to meeting you at a physically distanced uh, right spot later on. Back in uh, 1675, that's a while ago, I don't think anyone's alive then, 1675, the English preacher John Bunyan was thrown into prison, basically for preaching the gospel. Uh, but while in prison, he wrote an allegory, a story of the Christian life. John Bunyan, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you'd know the story. What's the story called? Call it out. Pilgrim's Progress, a great read. If English is your first language, let me highly recommend that you read that book, Pilgrim's Progress, at least once in your life, if English is your first language, or get it in, in the language uh, that you, your heart language as well. Great story. Um, on the screen is a, a couple of Im images of John Bunyan. I want to get there. These ones, there we go. Um, because he later wrote his autobiography, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. It's a title borrowed from our passage today that we'll get to eventually. But the, the idea is that there is a grace that outstrips, that outruns, that overpowers your and my many sins. There is a grace that can reach anyone. Grace abounding to the, to the chief of sinners. Back in May, uh, some of you may remember, I preached on Psalm 103 verse 12. Well, really, I preached to a camera. It was all very weird. Uh, I have a confession, I preached in my Ugg boots, it was good fun. Uh, but I preached there and I told you the story of Martin Lloyd-Jones, sorry, the great Martin Lloyd-Jones and a guy who was converted late in life under his ministry called Staffordshire Bill. And I told you that story to remind us of the truth and power of the gospel, that there is nobody beyond the hope of the gospel. There is hope for everyone. There is forgiveness for all your transgressions as far as the east is from the west. So far as God removed our sins from us. 
there is a fresh start on offer to anyone who comes in humble faith and repentance of their sins. Grace abounding to the chief of sinners. Um, I hope you were encouraged last month when Jayanne put together a series of videos of SBCers. Well, he didn't really put them together. He, he organised it, but Toby Davis sort of edited them all. But they were great stories of how people in this church came to believe and came to put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus, uh, how they came to follow him. So you might remember there was someone from a Mormon background, someone from a Muslim background, someone from an, a Chinese atheistic background who looked a lot like Jeff. There was someone from a Hindu background. There was even a non-religious Aussie background. Uh, and, and, and wonderful stories. And they really just highlight the message of the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Um, crosses all cultures and all nations and all languages and all genders and all ages and all social status as well. It's a wonderful truth. It's a message of John's Gospel from last month, remember, that eternal life is on offer for whosoever uh, comes to believe that God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son. And today in 1 Timothy, we'll see this truth applied once more. Grace abounding to the chief of sinners. We've been in 1 Timothy for two weeks We'll be in Timothy for a couple of more months, uh, seeking to learn what it, what, it, what it is to behave as God's household, scattered apart as we are, we, weirdly as we are, but what does it mean to behave as the household of the living God? Uh, and I've said up front that I want to apply these messages to Southside Bible Church and to a future church plant, Gungarlan Bible Church. Last week, though, I had the depressing task of speaking about false teaching in the church, entering church life, and the need for pulpit security or music stand security we need at Southside. Um, uh, guarding this gospel treasure. Well, now as we come to 1 Timothy chapter uh, 1, verses 12 to 17, it's almost like Paul's gone off on some sort of tangent, like Paul sometimes does in some of his letters, if you know them. But on closer examination, I think what we have here is an example of what he's been talking about in verses 8 to 11 of 1 Timothy chapter 1. Have it open in your Bible. 1 Timothy is where we're at. Here's an example, I think, of a false teacher of God's law. It's like he's saying, let me show you exhibit A. Let me show you example A and tell you what it looks like to wrongly use or wrongly apply God's good law. Now, you've got a talk outline as you came through, so inside your bulletin. You've also got a churchology lesson that I wrote that you can read at home, not during the talk. Have your talk outline in front, but please open up 1 Timothy chapter 1 in your Bibles. Uh, and Leslie is going to read to you, hopefully in a microphone that works. 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verses 1, sorry, verse 12 uh, to verse 17. So we're going to take this passage in two sections. Chapter 1, 1 Timothy Verse 12 through to 17. Thank you, Leslie. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received a mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you. Now, to fully understand these verses, you actually need to understand Paul's uh, dramatic conversion story that we read about in the Bible in Acts chapters 7 through to 9. So, if you've never read that part of the Bible, Acts chapter 7 to 9, maybe sometime this week, go away and read this amazing grace story. And if you're not yet a believer, if you're not yet a Christian... As you read that story, you actually have to come to terms with the fact that this is a true story. What do you do with this remarkable conversion story of the Apostle Paul? Well, Paul's saying here, 
look at my life. In these verses he's saying, look at my life. Here's exhibit A when it comes to the wrong use or wrong application of God's good law that he was talking about last week. For Paul misunderstood the law of God. He thought keeping the law was the way to please God. Uh, And Paul is one of the greatest examples of misusing God's law from the Old Testament. And in the end, he sums himself up. Have a look at verse 13 there. He says, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor of God, an insolent or violent man. Here is a brutal, bloodthirsty uh, man setting about to devastate and destroy this new movement known as the Way or Christianity. Here is a religious predator on the prowl. Here is, uh, today we'd call him a, a religious extremist on a par with a suicide bomber. There's no way we would let someone like Saul of Tarsus <coughs> uh, enter in, uh, into our country. We wouldn't give him an entry visa. No way. Humanly speaking, there was no hope for someone as far gone as Saul of Tarsus. But in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 17, he shows us that there is no one beyond the mercy of God. There is no one beyond the reach of God's steadfast love. There is no one uh, uh, outside the outstretched arms, if you like, of the Lord Jesus upon the cross. Two times he says, have a look at verse 13 and then verse 16. So verse 13 and verse 16. Two times he he reminds us, but I was shown mercy. The mercy that we learnt about or introduced in verse 2 of this letter. But I was shown mercy. The NIV, unfortunately, leaves out the but in verse 13. But it's important. Here's a great revolution that has happened. The reference there to, to acting ignorantly and in unbelief is simply saying what the rest of the New Testament will tell us. That while we were still sinners, while we were in our in ignorance and unbelief, Christ died for us. That as his enemies, Jesus lays down his life for us, gives his life and loves us. And then in verse 14, notice, he uses this uh, unique word, Greek word in the New Testament, that in English, it's simply translated overflowing or uh, super abundance is actually the, the, the better way to translate this word. Here is, he's describing God's grace, you see, um, gushing out or, or bursting forth out over Paul's blasphemous, violent character. I like to think of the grace of God coming out of a fire hydrant, a fire hose, rather than just a simple wimpy garden hose. No, this is whoosh! The grace of God has overpowered him. Here is grace washing crimson sins as white as snow. Here is grace washing a Samaritan woman clean. And not just any Samaritan woman, but the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4. Here is grace that knows no bounds. Grace abounding to the chief of sinners. I'm forever grateful for the lyrics of Rich Mullins, who's in glory now. He's with the Lord Jesus now, but he has a song. So if I stand, let me stand on the promise, God, that you will pull me through. But if I can't, let me fall on the grace that first brought me to you. In verse 16, God has deliberately made Paul exhibit A. He's holding up as an example of someone who misuses God's law but mercy in the gospel has found him. And it's all to do with the gospel. Notice verse 15. Look at verse 15. This saying is trustworthy, deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Uh, Elsewhere across the pastoral letters, and I mentioned last week, the pastoral letters are 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. Paul uses this phrase five times. Here is a trustworthy saying, or five different trustworthy sayings. He means here's something of great importance. Trustworthy saying, sit up and take notice. It's like the Lord Jesus when he'll often say in the Gospels, truly, truly, I say to you. He's saying, wake up, listen. It's a trustworthy statement. Remember last week, verse 3, Pastor Tim is ministering in a church where unacceptable teaching is occurring. But now here is something that deserves full acceptance. You can bank on this, Timothy. 
and, and, and Ephesus Bible Church and Southside Bible Church bank on this truth. I remember my very first ever doctrine lecture at uh, Moore College, a Bible college in Sydney by the then principal Peter Jensen. He asked us to give the gospel in a sentence. You should try it sometime. So here we were, a bunch of about 30 or 40 of eager, eager uh, theological students ready to take on the world, to be the next Billy Grahams. What's the gospel in a sentence? And we go, um, Jesus, um, sin, um, something about the cross, um, love. Here we were struggling away. In the end, he said, okay, come to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Here is the gospel in miniature. Have a look in your Bibles. It's also on the screen for you. Um, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The gospel in miniature. It tells us the who, what, how of the gospel. Who is this gospel about? Christ Jesus. He came. He entered history. Remember chapter 3 verse 16. He revealed, he appeared in the flesh. What did he come to do? Save sinners. Uh, We'll see next week, chapter 2 verse 5. Here is the one mediator between God and people, the man, Jesus Christ. How did he save sinners? By dying on the cross and rising to new life. Again, next week, chapter 2, verse 6, he gives himself, gave himself as a ransom for all. This uh, gospel message is consistent uh, with uh, the Lord Jesus and what he tells us in the gospel. So remember Mark chapter 2, verse 17? You do, trust me, when I tell you what it is. Jesus says, it's not the healthy that need the doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous or those who think they're righteous. I've come to call those who are sinners. And remember Luke 19, verse 10. Right at the end of the great story about Zacchaeus, Jesus says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. You can't get a a simpler summing up of the gospel than verse 15. This one verse has brought many to faith over down the centuries. Perhaps it can even bring you to faith. If you're here today not believing or maybe watching at home, here is a truth uh, that can be yours. You just simply insert your name. Christ Jesus came into the world to save Dom. Christ Jesus came into the world to save. Put your name in there. And then Paul adds, of whom I'm the foremost or the chief of sinners. He's simply highlighting the truth here that the closer you walk with God, the longer you're a Christian, the more you are aware of the depths of your sinful nature, the depravity of your your heart, really, and the greater appreciation that you have for the grace of God. Chuck Swindoll is a great American writer, storyteller. He writes, If the Lord came to earth looking for sinners, then Paul was too big a sinner to ignore. In other words, Paul's saying, Picture the most filthiest socks you can find. Maybe you've got them on at the moment, I don't know. These pair of socks, Paul's saying, I'm like this pair of socks that you've worn for weeks. They're disgusting, they're full of dirt and grime and smelly, they're just gross, they're stained. But soak them in nappy sand, as the ad tells us, and they come out bright clean, dazzling white. Well, that's what's happened to Saul of Tarsus when he comes into contact with the Christ Jesus who came into the world to save sinners. Grace abounded in Paul's life. And God holds him up as an exhibit, as an example of this is what the gospel can do. The hunter was hunted by the hound of heaven. And it was all God's initiative. Paul never forgets this grace and mercy from God. He's he's constantly uh, reminding his readers and the different churches in the New Testament letters of his dramatic conversion story on the road to Damascus. In fact... Uh, Dr. Luke, as he writes the book of Acts, he records Paul's conversion, Saul's conversion to Paul, three times in the book of Acts. Kent Hughes, another uh, Christian writer, uh, commentator, uh, has this great line, Saul, the untamable tiger, meets the lion of Judah on the Damascus off-ramp. 
Saul, the untamable tiger, meets the Lion of Judah on the Damascus off-ramp. Here is grace abounding to the chief of sinners. No wonder Paul bursts into another doxology, a song of praise in verse 17 there. He gave us a mini one in verse 11 last week. Here is gratitude for grace. There is ma the majesty of God, you see, lies behind the mercy of God. And the grace of God has so overwhelmed, has so super abundantly washed out over Paul, into Paul's life, that he can't help but burst into song. Only when you've experienced this mercy of God you see can you sing such a song as verse 17 look at verse 17 now to the king of ages immortal invisible the only God be glory and honor forever and ever some of you might know the great hymn that picks up on this line you know, immortal invisible God only wise in light inaccessible hid from our eyes you can get the Sino family to sing it to you after church we didn't get to sing it today but it's a great hymn that's picked up on this one line God has no rival, you see. God has no peer. Uh, he is the king for all ages. The Roman emperor, the Muppet king, or the, the Muppet kings and princes and presidents and prime ministers of our world, they might claim glory and honour, but it's only for a limited time. But here is God who towers over time, times and into eternity. And his crown lasts forever. All the other human crowns, they just crumble into dust or end up in museum pieces that are half broken anyway. You get the feeling Paul could have kept going here with his praise, just a one-line praise song to his glorious king, this is our eternal king. But instead, he actually remembers what's at stake in Ephesus. And he returns to the matter at hand here in verses 18 to 20 at the end of this chapter. And he takes us back to where we started in verse 3 and the problem of false teaching in Ephesus. So Leslie's going to finish this chapter, verses 18 to 20. Thanks, Leslie. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Thank you. So once more, um, Paul charges Timothy, or he commands Timothy. Remember verse 3 and verse 5. He's going back to the main issues of last week that we saw. And if Paul is exhibit A, this is what the gospel can do for a, for a false teacher or a wrong user of God's law... Then here's exhibit B of false teaching and what happens when, sadly, tragically, the gospel is rejected. Verse 18, he reminds Tim of an earlier time, uh, prophecies made about him, probably at his public commissioning, uh, which he'll pick up again on in chapter 4. And then the call from Paul is a personal call to a young pastor, Tim, to stay the course, Tim where others have shipwrecked, stay the course. Maybe the purpose of verses 12 to 17 there is for Paul to remind Timothy, hey Tim, if God can change and empower me for gospel service, remember verse 12, then he can surely do that for you, Tim, and your ministry that lies ahead. Now as you read through the New Testament, you'd realise that you, you see that Paul and Timothy have been together. Like, they're like the dynamic duo uh, without the capes and the bat cave, of course, but, but they're like synchronised swimmers without the pegs on their noses. They're, they're gospel co-workers. They're just in sync pre uh, preaching the gospel together throughout the New Testament story. Uh, Paul can even say this about Timothy in Philippians chapter 2. It's a great line. He writes, I have no one like Timothy. He has proven his worth to me as a son with a father. He has served with me in the gospel. Michael Card, another a uh, great Christian singer-songwriter, puts Paul's role with Timothy into beautiful poetry when he writes, He will come after me, a young Timothy, looking for someone to guide him. I will kindle his light, make him strong for the fight. I will promise to be there beside him. Paul says to Timothy, Stay the course. Hold the faith. 
with a good conscience. Don't get shipwrecked. I don't know if you've heard the, the tragic news coming out of the States of, a, of another gospel leader falling tragically with his wife, shipwrecking their faith, probably shipwrecking the faith of many university students. It's a terrible story. Paul's, Paul's saying, don't get shipwrecked. Stay the course. Typical Luther um, puts it like this. Martin Luther, in a great quote, he says, anyone can let the spit fly in public, which is a great image for COVID, isn't it? He says, anyone can let the spit fly in public and be considered a learned teacher, but Timothy, don't be like the false teachers. And now in verse 20, have a look. Paul's, uh, Timothy's contrasted with two blokes who failed to keep the faith. Hymenaeus and Alexander, they're probably leaders in the church or at least well-known in the church in Ephesus. H-man turns up again in the second letter of Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 17. And Alexander might be the same guy we meet in 2 Timothy chapter 4, but it's a common name, Alexander, so, and it occurs a few times across the New Testament letters, so we can't be sure there. We don't know the exact content of their false teaching, but what we do know is that they're bad sailors. They've shipwrecked their faith and probably others with them. They're probably part of the certain persons teaching different doctrines back in verse 3. They've thrown their conscience overboard. Last week, verses 5 to 7, they seem, they've deliberately and willfully rejected their conscience or we might say they've seared their conscience it's no longer tender it's hardened it's cortisized it's cortisone whatever it is quarters but burnt the burn it's not tender they've turned away from the sincere faith because of paul accepting the gospel in verse 13 paul moves from being a blasphemer to a believer but now in verse 20 these guys reject the gospel and tragically they've moved from believing of some sort to blaspheming. The reference there in verse 20 to handing them over to Satan is most likely a reference to excommunicating them from the church, casting them out of the, of the church, unpartnering them from God's household. Satan here is like God's agent, uh, like in Job chapter 2, verse 6. The same language actually is used by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. There, it's a tragic case again. Paul writes, Hand this man over to Satan. The man was involved in the sin of an incestuous relationship. You might remember that in 1 Corinthians. Terrible situation. Hand this man over to Satan so that his sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. You see, Paul's hope is always for restoration, for spiritual restoration and discipline to occur for both Hymenaeus and Alexander so that they might actually return to shore, that they might actually be able to climb into a lifeboat and not, no longer be shipwrecked. See, verse 20 shows us it's serious business to mislead the church, God's household. It's serious business to teach false. Uh, to teach false doctrines, to teach falsehood, and to bring uh, poisonous food into the flock, to, uh, into God's household. But for young Tim, he's to stay the course. Don't lose your bearings, Tim, when it comes to sailing for the gospel. Stick to the one true faith handed down by the apostles of the Lord Jesus. Timothy, he says, hold on to the faith and your good conscience and wage the good warfare. He'll say a similar thing, of course, in 2 Timothy now, chapter 4, fight the good fight, finish the race, keep the faith. Paul's point to Timothy, Paul's point to all of us, is we either keep going or we give up. We either keep sailing with the gospel wind in our sail or we let other doctrines blow and we shipwreck. How's your sailing going? SBC is, how are you sailing? Don't drift. Don't get shipwrecked. Stay the course. Keep your eyes in God's word. 
I love uh, stories from church history. Uh, this one's about a guy called Hugh Latimer. Hugh Latimer was a gospel minister and he was asked to preach at Hampden Court by King Henry VIII. Unfortunately, though, his gospel preaching offended the king. And so King Henry VIII asked the Reverend Hugh Latimer to come back the following week to preach again, but this time to apologise for what he said in his sermon. So Hugh Latimer began to preach, and we have a record of what he said. He began, Hugh Latimer, speaking to himself, Hugh Latimer, do you know before whom you, you are this day to speak? To the high and mighty monarch, to the king's most excellent majesty, who can take away your life if he is offended. Therefore take heed uh, that thou speaketh not a word that may displease. But then consider well, Hugh, do you know where you have come from? And upon whose message you are sent? Even by the great and mighty God who is all present and beholds all our ways and who is able to cast your soul into hell. Therefore take care, Hugh, that you deliver thy message faithfully. And then Hugh Latimer preached the exact same sermon he preached the week before with even more vigour and energy before King Henry VIII. What a man of God. What a way to hold on to the faith and a good conscience. What a way to wage the good warfare. Preach the truth, speak the truth, live the truth. Two applications, one for Southside Bible Church, and one for a future church plant called GBC, Gungahlin Bible Church, for Southside Bible Church. I think the longer you're a Christian, and I speak this out of experience now, I think the longer you're a Christian, the greater is the danger of straying onto forgetful green. Forgetful green is a made-up place by John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, forgetful green, apparently in, the, in Pilgrim's Progress, it's, recu- it's referred to as a most dangerous place for pilgrims, for Christians, as they journey onwards. See, forgetful green is the place where you're tempted to forget all the favours that God has poured upon you, you've received from God, and how unworthy you and I are of those favours. Forgetful green is the place where you're tempted to forget the mercy and kindness of the Lord Jesus that has been super overflowed into your life. Forgetful green is a place where you're tempted to forget that though your sins are many, his mercy is more. Paul never strayed onto forgetful green, as lush and green and inviting as it might have been. He never forgets, I was once a blasphemer, a persecutor of God, a violent man. He never forgets, but I received mercy. The grace of our Lord overflowed upon me. May we never forget May we never forget. If you are a Christian here today or watching, then do you realise you are a trophy of God's grace? A trophy of God's grace, an example of grace that outstrips, that overpowers, that overruns your many sins. You're an example of grace that can reach anyone. And if mercy and grace can get through to you and get through to me, then it can surely get through to your family and your friends and your work colleagues. So keep praying for them, that grace can abound in their life. And keep away from forgetful green. Keep away from forgetful green. Remind yourself often as you come to church, one of the beauties of coming to church is we do remind ourselves not to go on to forgetful green. Remind, remind one another at fellowship groups, in your discipleship groups. Remind yourself in your own quiet time. I have a little prayer uh, journal that I use, and I've written, I am a great sinner. But Jesus is a great saviour. And I remind myself of that wonderful truth often. For Gungahlin Bible Church, do you realise uh, we church plant, if you live in the Gungahlin area, do you realise we seek to church plant there not so that you can save petrol, but so that we can save souls. That's why we want to do that. And if the grace of God can reach someone like Saul of Tarsus, then it can surely, this gospel message can reach anyone in Gungahlin. And so, God willing, we church plant in this region uh, with the simple 
but God-empowered, grace-exploding message on our lips and adorned in our lives that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's all we have. That's all we need. Nine simple words that can change anyone. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Why don't we sing about that wonderful truth now and remind one another of that grace and mercy. Thanks, Daniela and Wei Shen. We stood beneath a debt that we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. Will you stand and join us as we sing this great song as a reminder of that? Praise the mercy is more stronger than darkness new every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more what love could remember we have done omniscient all knowing he counts not their song thrown into a sea with a bottom or shore our sins they are many his mercy is Patience would wait as we constantly roam. What father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the fatherless, the poor. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood neath the dead we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more is more stronger than darkness new every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the Lord his mercy is more stronger than darkness new every morn 
Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Please take a seat. Well, thank you, Dom and music team. Hope you all have been encouraged by God's word and the truth of the gospel. Now to he, him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. All right, have cafe time now. Let's all go outside and spur each other up onto love and good deeds. For those of you online, uh, you guys will have cafe time in your individual small groups.